Hey everyone, welcome back to Great Northwest Weaponry. This is Thomas, and today we are going to be continuing our discussion on Mausers and their evolution. So today we have got a Gewehr 88, uh, it's technically an 8805 as they're sometimes called, uh, a Gewehr 88 that was converted uh, in the early 1900s to a more updated style. We'll talk more about that when we get to the uh, into the gun room there, but uh, this... Uh, like I say, this is the second video in the Mauser series, and uh, from here we'll be able to branch into some other stuff. But uh, meanwhile, let's go ahead and go into the gun room and talk about what makes this gun a little different from your average Gewehr 88 and how it started as well. The history of the Gewehr 88 really only starts about two years before it was released. Uh, production of these guns was rushed by commission. Um, uh, commission formed specifically in response to the French reveal of the model 1886 Labelle chambered, chambered in 8mm Labelle, the world's first smokeless powder cartridge. So um, we discussed this a little bit when we talked about the Gewehr 7184, which was Germany's uh, shortest lived battle rifle. Uh, they, they spent all this time working on it, or Mauser did in particular, and they reveal the gun, and, and it's kept very secret, and then two years later, the French drop the bombshell that, oh, you, you've got this new gun? Well, we made a considerably better new gun. So, uh, I'm going to attempt a German word here. I, I did take a little bit of German in high school, but this is still a, a mouthful. The Gewehrprüfungskommission was established and uh, henceforth to be referred to as the GPK. Uh, but this was just a um, a German army led commission that was established specifically to uh, kind of figure out what to do about this this new development in firearms technology. A new arms race had just kicked off and France had made it known that they were in the lead and the Germans just couldn't have that. <laughs> and uh, so Basically, you could just say that's why we have the Gewehr 88, but um, essentially, they went, okay, we, we need to make a, a smaller, faster-moving bullet that is smokeless powder, and we need a new rifle to use it, and they started tossing around ideas of how they were going to do this, and basically what it boiled down to was they kept the Mauser style of uh, bolt action system, and then implemented a uh, monlicker style feeding system using end blocks of which uh, we'll look at the end block that would have originally been used in this when we go to the tabletop because this one was modified in 1905 but we'll get to that as well um so you basically have a mauser monlicker hybrid with barrel rifling that was patterned after the uh, the Labelle 1886, which this gun was directly going to be competing with. And the funny thing, though, is actually, uh, before we go any farther with this, the feeding system was so similar to the Monlicker rifles that Steyr actually won a lawsuit, um, <laughs> uh, basically a, a, a copyright infringement lawsuit on their design, and as such, you will see these manufactured by Steyr because that, that was basically the stipulations of the lawsuit was, yeah, you can make this rifle using our design that you stole, kind of, but we have to be allowed to make it and sell it to you as well. So Steyr did receive contracts for the Gewehr 88. This one is made at Spandau Arsenal, which Spandau, coincidentally, is the city in which this commission was held. But you get what you see before us today, which is, like I said, you've got basically a... Uh, Labelle pattern barrel, Mauser pattern bolt, Monlicker style of feeding system, and um, one thing that you can easily identify a Gewehr 88 from is this sleeved barrel, and this sleeve was meant to reduce the likelihood of damaging the barrel. It's kind of a kind of pointless. Like you'll see a lot a lot of countries that copied the Gewehr 88 did away with this altogether. Um, so this one went to Turkey at one point in its life, for instance. And uh, the Turks often with these would do away with the jacketed barrel and would just rebarrel them with, uh, with something else that was more practical and not quite as 
clunky as this huge hunk of steel that you see on this one. But back to our, our story in more linear terms. So in 1902, you've had this rifle has been around for, you know, 14 years. It's already been replaced by the Gewehr 98 at this point. This gun had about a 10 year service life. And even in that 10 years of its service life, they weren't exclusively used. The Germans were a little reluctant to do away with this thing that they had just paid all this money to have produced. So like, um, you, you can actually, and we talked about this in the episode on the Gewehr 7184, but you can see pictures from the Boxer Rebellion, which ended in 1901, mind you, of German soldiers still using the Gewehr 7184, of which at that point was beyond obsolete, was borderline useless. Germany was the only country officially still fielding black powder rifles in the Boxer Rebellion, of which is a little crazy to think of because up until right at that moment, in 1886, Germany was at the top of their game with the, um, in the arms game, basically. But uh, the Gewehr 88 isn't bad for its time. It was just a, a tough pill to swallow, considering the investment that had already gone into making a new gun just, you know, four years prior, Germany had fielded a new rifle. And then right in the middle of that, two years of that rifle being top of its class, and then now it's bottom of the barrel. And two years later, you have these being pumped out. So now back to 1902, where we kind of were started heading and then went off on tangent. You already have the Gewehr 98 is, you know, now the King Poobah of rifles and kind of remains to this day like the starting point of the modern, modern hunting rifle, basically. It was the Gewehr 98, of which we'll talk about more another day. But... They wanted to not just do away with these. They had made about 2 million of them between numerous manufacturers, including all the state manufacturers that were making them, which was basically the usual suspects, you know, Spandau, Danzig, Erfurt, and so on, uh, as well as Steyr and, um, oh, something in low. I'll, I'll type it over here, but th there were private companies as well as all of the state factories were pumping out, you know, like I said, about 2 million of these and... They still have them in arsenal, but they are chambered in a uh, what is often referred to as 8mm J. Uh, quick aside here, that is technically incorrect. That is what you will hear it referred to as. If you try to find 8mm J, you're going to look for it as 8mm J. But uh, it's actually an I, and the whole reason, but the whole thing with J being what it's called has to do with American soldiers misidentifying um, a German Gothic script where the capital I looks like a J. I for infantry, or the German spelling and pronunciation of the word infantry, which I believe is something closer to infantry. But and you'll also see that when it comes to the later ammunition, the 8mm JS is 8mm ISS, meaning Spitzer. And that's where we're going with this whole 1902 tangent that we keep on veering away from. So, in 1902, the 8mm Spitzer bullet was now being fielded in the Gewehr 98s, and they wanted to update the good old Gewehr 88s to just to extend their service life a little longer. So all that they really did was they reamed out um, inside the chamber a little bit and uh, often had to reline the barrel or kind of just drill it out a little bit because the uh, 8 millimeter Spitzer bullet is just ever so slightly bigger around than the um, non-Spitzer, the 8 millimeter Infantry Patron, 8 millimeter Infantry Spitzer Patron, uh, I believe is a 0.318 for the original round in diameter, 0.318 inches. And then it's like 0.324 inches diameter for the Spitzer. And it's also just a little bit longer and it's pointed. Spitzer bullets are a pointed bullet. They're lighter, they move faster, and they're just a more effective round. It's what we use to this day. So any gun that had that done to it will have an S stamped clearly on the top of the receiver. That's something that I'll show you again when we get to the tabletop. But then just a few years later, they went, well, we could do further updates. So that's where this one comes in because then they decided, okay, let's, let's make a cut 
so that we can use the same stripper clips that we use in the Gewehr 88. And uh, in so doing, they also covered the bottom with a stamped piece of steel so that the, uh, the end, there's no reason to have a spot for an end block clip to fall out because you're no longer using end blocks. Altered the springs inside to accommodate the new round. And, uh, you know, Robert's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt, you've now got a Gewehr 8805. There is another variant that came about a little later because these stuck around until World War I in Germany. And in 1914, this was done again. So about 300,000, or a little more than 300,000, were converted to the 8805. And then in 1914, you know, World War I is now in motion, of which is, you know, bad for everybody. Nobody is prepared for this. Nobody has enough guns for this. And Germany is looking at a two-fronts war from the get-go. So they need as many guns as they can get their hands on. So they bring uh, about 700,000 more of the 88s out of semi-retirement and make a cruder version of the 8805 conversion, which would now be called the 8814, where instead of cutting into these two pieces on the opposite sides here that are attached on the top of the bolt, they just simply put a ramp on there and welded it and just called it a day. And so we've just got this additional chunk here that is just very crudely added on and that way you can use your your five round stripper clips but that's basically the uh the full travel of this up to world war one now once you get into world war one germany has more problems of which any of you know anything about world war one know this two of their biggest allies are the austro-hungarian empire and the ottoman empire both are faring poorly pretty early on. The Ottoman Empire in particular is looking like they're not going to last more than a year or two max. So Germany starts sending them a bunch of weaponry and men. And Gewehr 88s were kind of the first guns that came to mind when it was, oh, the Otto our Ottoman allies need guns. We're giving all the crack troops our Gewehr 98s, and the 8805 isn't being used in its full numbers, so a lot of them are sent to the Ottoman Turks as war aid. This is one of those. Immediate way that you can identify it uh, is, is if the uh, rear sight is altered to Ottoman Turkish numerals. And they often would just fully replace this rear sight. This one appears to be a case of that. And again, we'll look at this also when we go to the tabletop here in just a moment. But the Ottoman Turkish numerals is a dead giveaway. But the Ottoman Turks also, like I said earlier, would often just straight up rebarrel these later on. They kept uh, modifying these well into the 30s and kept them around. until Basically until they switched to um, a gun that we've looked at in the past that I just pointed out over there that you probably can't see on screen. But uh, the... Turk Mauser uh, Ankara model 1938. That was pretty much the death of this. Uh, and as such, we'll, we'll, we will certainly be doing a versus video between this guy and the um, uh, Ankara M38. Losing my train of thought here. But anyway, let's go ahead and go to the tabletop view and look at some markings. I think we're about wrapped up on the actual historic travels of this gun. So a lot of the markings on this are fairly straightforward. Uh, pretty much everything is going to be just up on the receiver that you want to look at. So you got your your arsenal and spandau. Uh, you got the S stamp that I mentioned earlier that indicates that this was modified for the Spitzer cartridge. This gun is dated 1890. So uh, this is one of the one of the oldest rifles that I own. Then you got all your uh, all your Imperial German proof marks here. And I had mentioned the uh, Ottoman Turkish numerals on the rear sight, so that, that's what that looks like. And uh, there will be other guns in the future that we look at that feature this as well. Um, then you've got the mod modifications really are the next thing. So the big one is the notches cut in here. So you see this piece, these two pieces here were added, and then that notch cut. So I actually have um, a, a gun that we'll be looking at next in this series, probably, to demonstrate what that would have looked like beforehand, a Hanyang Type 88. 
So here's what the receiver would have looked like prior to modification, more or less. And then there's the receiver eh, after modification. So before, after. Take that aside. We'll look at that guy more another day. And then the plate that I'd mentioned covering the bottom. So originally you would have fed this with one of these. This would have gone in right about here, but because of these pieces, this no longer really fits inside the gun. But this is a end block and this is what you would use in the Hanyang, which again, we'll talk about that more later. Now we'll be using these, but we'll look at that in a moment when we go to shoot this gun some more. The last thing that we really need to take a peek at is bolt extraction, which is standard Mauser fare, just pulled all the way back, and then uh, you've got a button on this side. You can see it there. Just depress and pull the rest of the way out. Then reinsertion, just put it in until it stops, press, and slide. And that's all she wrote, really. Um, hadn't mentioned the bayonet attachment for this gun. It is actually mounted on the side, like on the Gewehr 7184. And I believe that is actually where we will be ending and going to shoot this gun some more and show you how to load it. So loading this, uh, as we discussed a bit at the uh, uh, tabletop view, is a little different than loading an original Gewehr 88. Uh, Again, we already mentioned this, but you've got cuts here so that this accepts stripper clips rather than the older end blocks that we looked at. And the bottom plate is covered so that uh, you don't just have stuff falling out of the bottom. So you just take your 8mm Mauser clip and insert into that rail and push all the way down. It's best if you use kind of the, the base of your thumb to do it and then just kind of finish by just kind of finishing with that and just push that last one in. This can be kicked out by just sliding the bolt forward. Uh, and with this gun, with most Mausers, you can close the bolt over a loaded magazine. With this one, it doesn't seem to be able to because of just how tight the single stack is here. Uh, because of this being the conversion, it doesn't smoothly close over top of a fully loaded magazine. So when you close the bolt, if you're going to carry it, you would then be turning the safety on, which is right here. It is just your standard Mauser wing style safety. So that's safe. That's fire. Let's go ahead and uh, take this last five shots here. All right, this thing's a smooth shooter, guys. Uh, the Gewehr 88 kind of gets some crap for uh, the fact that it was the the uh, committee designed ma commission Mauser, as some people call it. Uh, but you know, it, especially the 8805s, of which you know, with it being an 8805, as, as again as we've discussed, you can use standard eight millimeter Mauser and don't have to worry about the difference between eight millimeter J and eight millimeter JS. But so with that, ammo is not hard to get for these. Uh, I would not recommend using high-powered 8mm Mauser. Uh, PPU or Privy Partisan is a pretty light load that uh, th these seem to like. But it's accurate. It's got a really smooth bolt. I, I've really got no complaints. And then with the fact that this one was uh, probably given to Turkey as war aid, or almost certainly was considering the site that we discussed before, you know, this thing could have been at Gallipoli, which I find awesome. That's one a really interesting battle to learn about. And uh, this kind of adds to my collection in a way that a lot of other things wouldn't because I've been looking for something Turkish uh, for, for uh, to represent the Ottoman Turkish Empire in my World War I collection for a long time. And this fills that, uh, that void. So as such we might down the road be doing a versus between this and the uh, enfield number one mark three for like a battle of gallipoli facsimile type of thing but until then i hope you all enjoyed this video it's been thomas great northwest weaponry and i'll see you next time